Hello everybody, welcome to another video. I hope you're all having a safe and healthy quarantine. Speaking of quarantine, I'm stuck inside today, so I figured I'd go ahead and throw one of my favorite pictures on the background there, and uh, kind of distract from the fact that we've been trapped inside for over a month. So, but today, I realized that it's gonna be almost exactly one year since I installed my SeaTech D250SA battery charger in my Subaru. I thought it would be a good opportunity to finally knock out this review. I've been trying to make this video for the last few months and I just never liked it. So hopefully today we can just push through and get it, get it done. So, so within an, a, a few weeks, it'll be exactly one year since I installed the SeaTech D250SA in my Subaru. And uh, since then I've put about 10,000 miles on the car uh, driving, you know, with the SeaTech always going and charging my auxiliary battery. So, at, at risk of this getting a little bit too long-winded, I want to be thorough, but I don't want to be boring. So, um, my general impressions after one year, it's great. I really love the SeaTech D250SA, and I highly recommend it. So, if that's enough for you to go out and buy one, there you go. So before we dive into a more thorough review, here's a quick shot overview of what the SeaTech is. The SeaTech D250SA is a DC to DC 5-step smart battery charger for your auxiliary battery systems like you'd find installed in many camper vans, overland vehicles, and RVs. In other words, it's like a smart battery charger you might find in your garage, only it's powered by the vehicle's alternator rather than a wall outlet. On top of being a smart charger, it also acts as a battery isolator, protecting the charge of your vehicle's main battery while running accessories off of your auxiliary battery system. This prevents a situation where you wake up to find out that the fan you were running all night drained your vehicle's main battery and now the engine won't start. Another awesome feature of the SeaTech is a built-in MPPT solar controller that can handle solar panels from 50 to 300 watts with a maximum input voltage of 23 volts. SeaTech also mentions that the solar panel input can be used for alternative power sources like a wind turbine. The SeaTech will also allow a trickle charge of your vehicle's main battery from a solar panel when the vehicle is not running. The types of auxiliary batteries that are compatible with the D250SA are standard lead acid batteries, an AGM battery, and gel batteries. Lithium batteries are not supported by the D250SA, however SeaTech has announced a new model called the D250SE that is compatible with lithium batteries and the other ones as well. Okay, now let's dive into a more thorough review. Who is this kind of device and this setup um, good for? Honestly, I feel like it's best suited for uh, like a camper van situation or somebody who has like a somewhat decent overlanding vehicle setup, whether it's a Jeep or a truck or whatever. So uh, for people who want to be going out and spending time remotely for longer periods of time and not have a enormous power setup. So for me, uh, the vehicle I put it in is my Subaru um, Outback. It's more or less a weekend vehicle at the moment because of the pandemic and we're trapped, but I I modified my car for very long-term traveling and essentially living out of. Um, so that's why I chose this system for me. I also say that it could, it, it would, it would work well for maybe a smaller RV. Uh, if you're doing like, like a diesel, big pusher motor home, um, probably you're going to be running the people who are boondocking and going off grid with those big setups are running huge solar panel arrays um, that require a little bit more specialized um, specific like solar equipment for a, an array that big or a panel system that big. Um, not to say you couldn't use this, but it, like I said, if you're going months at a time or you're l literally living full time out of a big RV that has large appliances, you pro this probably is a little bit underkill for what you you would be needing. Plus RVs usually have their own charging setup for their auxiliary batteries anyway. So camper vans, you know, overlanders kind of even even weekend rigs if you have if you wanted to be dispersed camping and you want to run a fridge or something in your car, this it, this is a good system for that. Without trying to get too much into the nerdy details, um quick explanation on the difference between 
um, a DC DC charger and a voltage sensitive relay. Now, if you've done any research into um, dual battery systems for vehicles or vans or RVs, uh, you probably came across a lot of VSRs, or voltage sensitive relays, or split charge systems. Um, those are all the same thing. A DC to DC charger is basically that, but on the next level. To make it simply, a voltage sensitive relay, all it does is is just sense the the voltage on your car's main battery that you start the engine with and everything. It watches that, or doesn't really watch it. It's just a pressure. It's a electrical electrically sensitive switch. Um, so once it detects essentially that your car's battery is fully charged, it switches over and allows the alternator to kind of trickle over and charge your extra battery. Now that works great. Um, for example, if you have a vehicle, say like a, a truck or a van or kind of a full-size vehicle, say older than like 2010, I'll, I'll explain why that age in a little bit, um, and you have enough room in your engine bay to put a second battery, for example, I used to have a 98 um, K1500 half ton Chevy pickup and there was literally a spot for a second battery in the engine bay because the truck was offered with diesel and they run two batteries. Uh, mine was a gas and I had an empty spot. If you have room to make a bracket or an existing location where you can put a second battery, honestly, I'd probably say bang for buck Cost-wise, you probably be better getting a standard deep cycle battery, non-AGM, standard deep cycle battery, and a split charger. It would save you a lot of money, and it would work. So, that's that. Uh, however, if, like in my situation, I had no room for a second battery inside my engine bay, that meant the battery had to go inside the car with me. Mine's sitting in the passenger floorboard, uh, if you have a van, a lot of people will mount them in the back. If they built like a cabinet or a kitchen area, um, they'll mount them like in the spare tire well or something. If it's going to be inside the car with you in a place where you're going to be sleeping or whatever, um, I'd say don't go with a VSR and for you'll um, and a standard battery. You're going to want an AGM battery uh, and the important difference there is that the AGM batteries they don't spill um, and they don't vent any gases under normal charging conditions. A standard battery like the car or the battery that's probably under the hood of your car when it's charging it's venting out hydrogen and all kinds of bad gases that are um, dangerous. An AGM battery doesn't do that so typically you want an AGM battery inside the car with you if that's where you're gonna have to store it. Uh, it's a lot safer and the only time they vent hydrogen is if they're being overcharged which isn't likely to happen but anyway they're just much safer to have in the car with you. Um, and in, in that case a split charge system it'll work on an AGM battery, but not very well. Um, a lot of people still do it. I see a lot of companies offering to install a dual battery system on cars, like off-road shops, um, and they say, hey, we're gonna use this awesome AGM battery and this really cool split charger. And yes, it'll work. You will put some charge into that AGM battery, um, Here's the problem. AGM batteries have a specific charge profile. So they send a certain amount of current, they send more current, less current, more current, less current. They have a specific charge profile to charge them properly, to charge them fully, and uh, that helps maintain the life. The problem with just a VSR or a, a relay that taps off your alternator is it's just trying to trickle charge in there as if it was a normal battery. And while it will put some charge in there, you'll never get it to charge 100% and it'll decrease the life of the battery because it's not being charged properly. So while it works, it decreases the life of the battery and you won't actually really get 100% of the charge. That's where the DC-DC charger comes in. It's a smart charger, like I said. It knows the charge profile for an AGM battery. So it can charge it properly 
comparing the two. A VSR, probably spend around 100 bucks. It's it, total, I mean, I'm guessing, uh, minus the cost of a battery. They're cheap, um, you know, and effective. Uh, however, the DC-DC charger has certain benefits, like mainly specific charge profiles that'll maintain the life of your battery. Okay, so why did I say vehicles before 2010? Now, 2010, that's just kind of a ballpark number. Each vehicle is going to be different. But around then, and most modern vehicles have what's called smart alternators. So before, in vehicles like my Subaru and pretty much most vehicles that we know before that time frame, uh, alternators put out around 14 volts fairly consistently to maintain your vehicle's starting battery and that was a pretty reliable number. What they ended up doing later on is they've introduced smart chargers and they are able to drop down even lower to I think even like 12 and a half, 13 volts, um, basically to save on efficiency, save gas mileage and fuel efficiency. The problem is that's not very many volts and you can't efficiently charge a battery off an alternator that's barely putting out enough volts to maintain one battery. So what you can do with a DC-DC charger is on a modern vehicle with a smart alternator, uh, you can hook it up and it's still able to boost that voltage and proper send the proper amount of, of voltage to the extra battery, despite the fact that you have a small smart alternator that is um, running a lower voltage. Vehicles that have a smart alternator should use a DC-DC charger. Um, really, I mean, they kind of have to. Uh, a VSR is just not gonna be very practical on a newer vehicle like that. So that's why I said 2010. So the SeaTech D250SA is a DC-DC charger. That's what I decided to go with because I'm using an AGM battery stored inside my car with me. The uh, the battery I'm using is a Duracell Platinum 92 amp hour AGM battery that I got from Batteries Plus. And it wasn't cheap either. It was around $260. Um, you know, battery systems aren't cheap. It's just kind of the way it is. You can do it on the cheap and there's ways to get around it. You can make a manual switch, uh, but convenience wise starts going way downhill when you get to the cheaper options. So. Also, I'll talk about the cost. I, I mentioned the cost a little bit. A, a VSR is much cheaper than a DC-DC charger, generally speaking. There are some cheaper ones out there I'll mention later. I think a general VSR split charge kit on like eBay, Amazon, are somewhere around $7,500. Um, whereas the SeaTech D250SA um, is uh, I paid like $270, $280 for it. So it's quite a bit more expensive. Um, so, I mean, that's just the way it is. I will also mention a lot of people now are switching over to lithium batteries. And this is worth mentioning because the SeaTech D250SA that I'm reviewing and kind of talking about here is not compatible with lithium batteries. It's only for lead acid, normal batteries, deep cycle battery, or AGM batteries, excuse me, and gel batteries. Uh, it's not for lithium batteries. However, uh, just like within the last week or so, I, I've found out that SeaTech has announced a new DC-DC charger, the D250SE, which has a charge profile for lithium battery. And looking at the specs and the pictures, I'm, I'm fairly positive, obviously I can't be 100%, I didn't design the thing, I'm fairly positive that it's essentially the exact same charger as the D250SA, only they've added a new charge profile that's acceptable with uh, lithium batteries. I'm, I'd even bet that the hardware all inside is the same. They just messed with the programming and the charge profiles. So know that if you're wanting to run lithium batteries, uh, there is an option. In fact, it might even be phasing out the SA um, because the SE is also compatible with gel batteries and AGM batteries. So I imagine they're probably discontinuing the SA and the SE is gonna be there, but I think this this review and topic will 
transfer over because like I said it seems to be the exact same thing. Okay so a little bit of specs on the D250S. So it is a 25 amp DC DC charger. It charges at 20 amps so it takes in a maximum of 25 amps from your alternator and it charges up to 20 amps and anywhere from around 14 to 14.7 14 to 13 something volts and like for me, that depends on the charge profile of the AGM. If I turn on my voltmeter, I can watch it go through the cycles of pulsing power into the AGM to uh, get it charged. I'll also note that the D250SA by itself, um, up to about 100 amp hours of battery storage, um, I'm at 92, around 100 amp hours or so, uh, that's what they kind of recommend for the D250 by D250SA by itself. Um, they also sell an add-on, which is another box called a Smart Pass, which basically if you're running up to 300 amp hours of battery banks, which is quite a bit, that, that's when you're kind of talking more like full-size RVs and stuff. Um, the Smart Pass basically, it's, it kind of boosts the input to those and allows the charging to go faster for larger battery banks and it also allows you to drain harder equipment like if you're running a fridge and I don't know just heavier items and charging at the same time um, it, it allows you to do that. Uh, i not running a fridge I've charged things like USB things while I'm driving and never had an issue uh, with the D250 SA by itself, I don't have the smart pass and it wasn't an issue, but I imagine it's for heavier load items, like I said, like a fridge or something. So the smart pass itself is another like $260, $280. It's not cheap, um, but that's when you're kind of, you're not talking cheap anyway. If you're talking 300 amp hours of battery banks, yeah, a budget really, a budget system isn't exactly your goal at that point, I don't think. Um, typically speaking. Another amazing thing with the D250SA, I've, this isn't something I've taken advantage yet of yet, but it, I'm glad that it's an option here. It also has a built-in MPPT solar controller. So normally when people are running solar panels, you run the, you don't run the, tie the panels directly to a battery um, because you can overcharge the battery and it can explode quite literally. Um, you run the panels into a and PPT charge controller that that safely charges your battery bank. This has one of those built in and that's pretty awesome because it's all one unit. It makes it so much easier in the, as far as wiring goes. Uh, you literally just run a wire, a fuse, or a circuit breaker um, and just run that one line with an inline breaker or, or a fuse right to the CTEC and a ground cable. It, that's it and that's pretty awesome now the uh, the solar controller it's not like a crazy big one so again if you're running a huge array like multiple multiple solar panels and you're running like a, a 24 volt system and or higher you're gonna need a specialized solar controller for that uh, this has a maximum input voltage of 23 volts so it's not the lowest, not the highest. As far as solar goes, it also sends the maximum output of 20 amps. So, but a 23 volt system. So you don't want to run your solar panels in series um, and accidentally be dumping like 40 volts into the charger. That's no good. It has a max input of 23 volts, which is good for like, I'd say probably like a 100 watt good size panel. Um, if you mount that to your roof of your van or your roof rack on your overland vehicle, uh, you're probably right in that spot. You're probably around the 20 volt range and you're, you're good to go. Um, so it's awesome that it's there. It's awesome that it's easy to set up. It's able to charge from both at the same time. And actually even in the manual, it says you can run wire in like a wind turbine. So you actually have a lot of options there. Now, how long does it take to charge? I can't say because battery banks are gonna be different, different storage capacities of different battery banks, whatever your situation's gonna be. Personally, 
Uh, I have a 92 amp hour battery. I actually ran it completely flat, like dead, dead flat. I was a little bit worried that I damaged the battery. It was at like five volts when I, I opened the car and realized my inverter had been left on. And uh, I was a little bit worried. And I'd say it took about three hours total of driving around off and on over a couple days. Uh, and it, before it finally completely recharged again. So if you're doing a decent day haul trip, you can top that thing up. You know, three hours for, um, for me isn't that bad of a drive. I don't know, maybe you can help use that to gauge how long it would take to charge up your system. Uh, like I said, if you're gonna run the smart pass, it's gonna be a lot different. If you're running different size batteries, it's gonna be different, times are gonna vary. So just, you have to do some research or play with experience at that point. Okay, so let's jump into the computer now and I'll talk a little bit about the installation and wiring process. It's really not that complicated at all. Um, when I found this and I opened up the manual and looked at it, I was like, whoa, that's it. And from the time I got my, my cables made um, for the charger, it took less than an hour to have it installed and running in the car and charging. So it's really simple to install and uh, yeah, that's kind of what I love about it, and it's fairly modular. It's supposed to be a perm semi-permanent mount, I'd call it. They call it a permanent mount, but if I wanted to move it from one vehicle to another, it, it really wouldn't be that bad. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about wiring the C-Tech and how to install it. So to start off here, we're going to have the cranking battery, which will be inside your engine bay. That's the battery that you start your car with. You're also going to have your alternator inside the engine bay. Your cranking battery is obviously attached to the alternator in your car, that's how it stays maintained. Now we're going to be introducing the C-Tech. For me, my C-Tech is mounted inside the car. That means the wires that are going to connect from the cranking battery to the C-Tech are going to pass through the firewall and inside the car. So the first wire you're seeing here is the positive wire that connects directly from the cranking battery to the bottom left alternator end post on the C-Tech. Now on this positive cable, somewhere near the cranking battery, you're going to want to install a 30 amp fuse or a circuit breaker. So let's talk about connecting the AGM battery. From the bottom right corner of the C-Tech is the positive out. And just like on the positive in cable, you're going to add a 30 amp fuse or circuit breaker to the auxiliary battery side. For the negative cable, you're going to basically just be connecting the negative terminal on the auxiliary battery and the negative terminal on your cranking battery. The top right terminal on the C-Tech is the negative out. That connects directly to the negative terminal on the auxiliary battery. Now on the bottom far right side of the C-Tech, there will be a red and black wire coming out that aren't connected to anything. The way you connect these wires is what determines the charge profile that the C-Tech is going to be using to charge the auxiliary battery. In my case, I'm using an AGM battery, so I need to connect the black wire to a ground, which I just did by grinding off a little bit of paint and bolting a ring terminal directly to the chassis of my car. Above those two wires is a black wire that has a little black box attached. That's the temperature sensor for the charger, so it can read the temperature of the auxiliary battery. You simply just tape that to the top of the battery. Lastly, we're going to talk about adding in a solar panel. I don't have one, but I figured this would be helpful anyway. According to the manual, you can just hardwire in the positive and negative wires directly to the C-Tech charger. They don't call for a fuse or a circuit breaker on the solar panel positive, but I imagine you could add one if it would make you feel better. Okay, so let's talk about some competitive options um, that are out there. So I'm going to kind of go from uh, cheaper, and I'm just talking DC-DC chargers. I'm not going to get back into the relays and stuff. So just DC-DC chargers um, from kind of cheapest to a even more expensive situation. Um, their Renogy uh, makes a decent looking DC DC charger. I mean, I don't have experience with all these. I just kind of looked around to see what else was out there. Um, it's a little bit more of a, uh, a manual setup. You have to push in these little pins, I guess, to set the charge profiles that you want, uh, push little buttons and stuff. Uh, it's a lot cheaper. It's $130 compared to the C-Tech. So maybe if you're kind of on the edge of swinging for a VSR kit, uh, and you feel like the DC-DC charger is kind of out of reach, but you don't you don't mind a couple extra steps and 
uh, of, um, of work on uh, setting the profiles and stuff, maybe the Reno G would be a good option for you. It, like I said, it's cheaper. Uh, it does not have a solar input, so you'll be missing that. Also, Reno G is kind of, um, they're kind of making a name for themselves as far as the off-grid power, I'd say solar panels and stuff go. They're, they're like a budget option that's not terrible. They're getting a good reputation. So the next one I found was from a company called Victron. Um, the Vic, I don't have a specific model, but if you look up this kind of specs, you'll, you'll find which one I'm talking about. Uh, it's about the same price as the SeaTech. It's $263 for the charger itself. And it's the charger with an isolator. They're, they sell some that are just a charger with no isolation feature. This one has the isolation feature. I tried to find one as close to the SeaTech as possible. The downside is it does not have solar panel inputs. So it's just a DC-DC charger at the same price. One cool thing about it though is it has Bluetooth monitoring so you can monitor what's going on with the charger and your batteries on your phone. That's kind of neat. Um, I don't mind just flipping on my switch and seeing what the voltage is at and what would not, but that's another option. Now on the more expensive end, even more expensive than the SeaTech is the Red Arc. Let me make sure I get this model number right. The BCDC 1225D. Now it's about a hundred dollars more. Uh, it does have a solar panel input, um, but it outputs about five amps more. So the SeaTech outputs a, a maximum of 20 amps. This The Red, Red Arc outputs 25. So, and just looking at their specs and kind of scrolling through the website, it seems like that it probably charges a little bit faster. So if, um, you know, say you have the same setup as me, but from dead, dead flat, three hours is too much driving for you. Um, maybe the Red Arc would be a better option. It would charge it a little bit faster. At least that's kind of what I'm gathering from their website. Also, Red Arc is a hugely popular brand in the overlanding community. They're, they're very well known. Um, I think they're based out of Australia, if I have that correct. Um, so really good equipment. People absolutely love them, but they are expensive. So I'll also mention that I haven't had any issues with the SeaTech itself. The last video I uploaded, um, I, I had had an issue with my dual battery system and it wasn't charging. Uh, that came down to a bad circuit breaker. Um, the one that actually is between the, um, the starter battery and the charger itself, uh, that circuit breaker went bad. And uh, I diagnosed it and replaced it with a nicer Blue Sea Systems uh, waterproof 30 amp breaker and I uh, haven't had any issues since. So that, that wasn't an issue with the SeaTech itself. The SeaTech has been performing flawlessly. So to, let's kind of summarize this. The major benefits of the SeaTech system is that it's very simple to install and its compatibility with um, you know standard lead acid batteries, AGM, and now with the D250SE, it, it includes lithium as well. I'd say probably the major cons of the SeaTech especially for people who are just kind of looking into these systems and, and trying to decide if it's worth it, is the cost. Um, you know, $260 just for the charger. If you're going to go with an AGM battery, you're probably spending upwards of $200. Uh, you know, it wasn't cheap. I, my, altogether, my system with the, the battery, the SeaTech, and my inverter, and, um, you know, miscellaneous things, the, the circuit breakers and stuff, was around $600. Um, yes, that's quite a bit, especially since I just installed it in a Subaru. Um, but I wanted to overbuild my system so that I could expand on it later and, um, and potentially move it into a bigger vehicle. I'm actually, I'm, I am going to be building a van at some point in the future, um, cause the Subaru is just too small for me. And, uh, I'll probably be moving that system into there and I can add on some things to the SeaTech and I won't have to go back and, and replace a bunch of stuff um, and basically start over from scratch. It's really simple to just to add into that system that I already built, I already spent the money and it's there and it's good, solid, reliable, um, 
good solid and reliable equipment. But cost aside, and the initial upfront cost aside, um, I don't, I can't really find any fault with the SeaTech. It's like, you know, I'm not gonna go over it again, but I, I really love the SeaTech. Uh, if I eventually upgrade to lithium batteries, probably when they get a little bit cheaper, um, I'll probably end up replacing the D250SA with the SE. Um, in fact, if you're watching this and you're looking, the D250SA might not even be available anymore. I'm pretty sure they're phasing it out with the SE, but I, like I already mentioned, I'm fairly certain that it's the exact same charger with the brand new charge profile for lithium. So anyways, that's it. Hopefully I didn't let this ramble on too long. I know I hit the record limit on my camera at least once. So if you did watch the whole thing, uh, thanks for watching. I'll put a link down to the stuff I talked about to the SeaTech as well as those competitive options uh, down below. Uh, unfortunately, the SE is not available on Amazon when I'm filming this, but whenever it becomes available, I'll put a link down there too. But for now, I'll put a link to SeaTech's website. And if you Google it, you might be able to find somewhere to, to buy the SE. So that's it for this one. I hope you guys are staying safe out there with this pandemic stuff going on. And hopefully we can all get back to adventuring and exploring soon. I know I am ready to get back at it, getting a little bit of cabin fever. But until next time, and on the next video, I will see you guys later. If you like to follow along with the rest of our adventures, make sure to subscribe. And to make sure you don't miss out on any other videos, click the notification bell as well.